This is Get Real with Deb Waterbury, a show where Dr. Deb gets real as she teaches through books and studies on topics relevant for today. And now, here is your host, Dr. Deb Waterbury. Hello there. So, welcome back. We are in the second week of talking about First Peter. And just as a recap, I just want to make sure that y'all remember that we're doing this Tired of Standing, which is the title of this message or this whole series on First Peter that y'all realize that this is an encouragement. This is Peter wrote this letter to people just like you and I, who are living in situations just like we're living in. And and this this whole letter is meant to be an encouragement. So I I also wanted to stress that I I think it's really important that you, if you're doing this at all and you wanna do it as a study, that because we're doing it expositionally, which means we're taking it verse at a time, right straight through to the end, we do have PDFs available at my website at debwaterberry.com. You'll just go to the store, and then under store, you'll see downloads. When you go to downloads, you'll hit the Tired of Standing series, and then you'll be able to see all those PDFs that you can download that are um, study questions for each week. They'll help you get through this because, again, as we're moving through a verse at a time, it is really important that you're getting the, you know, really getting in deep with that. So last week, we just did the introduction, and so with this time, I want to move on into the next set of verses, and, and the title of this one and, and is, is a reminder toward holiness and and why we move toward holiness and where where's the encouragement in that because sometimes that cannot even feel like an encouragement when you're being told to be holy so where is the encouragement in that and this is his reminder we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 21 in chapter 1 of first peter and again like i said i'm going to move through this just a verse at a time um and and i want to get right into it because peter gets right into it here after he finishes the introduction he goes straight with verse six and, and verses six and seven talks about rejoicing in whose we are both in who we are and in whose we are so what i want to do is, is start right off again i'm reading from the english standard version you can again read from any version you want to that's just to make sure you know where i'm reading from i'm going to start then in first peter chapter one and i want to read verses six through seven to you okay so verse six says in this you rejoice now remember he's you have to the verses before in this he's talking about having that that imperishable inheritance that we get from being born again so he's saying in that we rejoice in that he said in this you rejoice though now for a little while if necessary you have been given you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so Peter here is starting saying again, you rejoice in the fact that you have an inheritance that has been promised to you because you've been given new life. So the qualification for that rejoicing there is that, that we know what we have. But then notice what he says. There is a quantifier there when he says even though right now you might be suffering. And I hit on this a little bit last week. I just want to say it a little bit more in depth this week. You, you know, we suffer and we know that we suffer and we have persecutions and all these things happen to strengthen our faith, to to grow us in our spirituality. But even beyond that, I think we need to recognize that that if I'm not suffering, if I'm not, if I'm comfortable, if everything's hunky-dory in this life for me, then I'm going to have to wonder, is this my home? Is this where I belong? Because the fact that we suffer, the fact that we're not comfortable in this skin, in this life, in this world, is an indication that we have more ahead of us, that this is not my home, that I'm an alien. So, you know, it's difficult to rejoice in your trials, although Paul tells us to do that. Um, he says rejoice, and again I say rejoice, and then he tells us, and, and, and then James tells us over and over again that this is where we find our joy, that we're going to have some trials. You know, it's difficult to do that. But if we can at least come to it from that perspective of, of course, I'm having problems. <laughs> this is not my home. I'm an alien in a foreign land. I am looking forward to my inheritance in my home. Um, you know, it, it says we're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ in, in um, Romans chapter 8. I read that last time. Provided, and I want to make sure you hear the rest of that verse. So this is Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 17. Paul writes, we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, comma, and then this is the, this is the sec- sentence you got to listen to. Provided we suffer with him 
in order that we may also be obtained with him. So it is, we are fellow heirs as long as we're suffering with him because this wasn't his home and it's not our home. It's really kind of an indication of, of to whom you belong. Peter's reminding them, he's reminding us that suffering is the proof in the pudding that we're his and that this is not our home. So we also rejoice then in whose we are. Let me go on then to verses 8 and 9 here. Verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, we're talking about Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your, of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know, if we can remember that belonging to Christ should give us joy that's inexpressible, that's, you know, incomparable, it really is about desiring him. The Christian desires Christ. The Christian desires to be more like Christ. The Christian desires to be with Christ. The Christian desires fellowship and relationship with Christ. For no other reason than it gives you inexpressible joy. You know, you might find, it might be fun and have some happiness with somebody else for a minute. But if you want inexpressible joy, the believer knows you go to Christ. I love how John Piper put this. He said, Christians, a Christian's joy is the joy of craving the preciousness of Jesus and the reliability of Jesus. You become what you crave. Ooh, that's a, there's a lot of truth in that. You become what you crave. Christians crave Christ, therefore they become like Christ. You know, we should take that little sentence to the bank. You become what you crave. What do you crave? Because you will become that. The Christian should crave Christ to become like Christ. And that's, that's what a true Christian does. We also, again, another point here is that we're going to rejoice in our inheritance, um, even as the prophets and the angels have looked toward this. And, you know, I, I love this section of, of 1 Peter when he's talking about this. And this is, I don't I won't stay here long, but I want to read these verses because it's a beautiful thing. We rejoice in what we've been given because the prophets a long time ago were just looking so forward to it. Angels, what these verses are going to tell us is that angels look on what you and I are going to get and they're, they just, they look on it longingly for what you and I have been promised. So verses 10 through 12, these are just really beautiful and encouraging. We won't, we won't camp here. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So he's saying basically here, the prophets were looking for this man and you've already got it. Going on in verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from angels, things into which angels long to look. That's, that's really amazing, and I think we take that for granted sometimes. I believe that sometimes we'll take for granted that which we have given. When the angels are longing to look at that which we have been given, that which has been revealed to us, um, it's a beautiful thing. And, and there's, that's, that in of itself is a means, a reason to rejoice. And then Peter goes on and tells us that in this rejoicing that we're called to a holy lifestyle. So this is where I get into kind of the meat of this lesson that is, is a reminder toward holiness. That the, and holiness, you know, doesn't mean you're perfect. That's not, and although we are moving toward that, it doesn't mean you're perfect. The word holy means being set apart, being seen as different. You know, if I look like the world, then there's a problem, isn't there? So being a holy person and going toward a holy lifestyle means you're set apart. You don't belong. I mean, by the very essence of that word means you don't belong. And so when he started this out, you know, talking to these poor exiles who have been exiled from their own homes for, in an emotional standpoint, he's saying, you know, you, um, this is, this is holiness will, re will require you to be set apart from that which is not godly. And, and being set apart means you're not, you don't belong to that anymore. And so, you know, there, and you know, there are too many Christians, I think that don't really understand what that means. And they, and they'll, you know, they put on a show to, to you know, this outward is kind of like that pig analogy that I used last time about dressing up a pig like sheep. So going to be a pig. I read, read this story about this guy who's a given, he was a California driver's license instructor. And he was talking about this young man who um, was doing the test. And he said he was doing great up until that. He said he did great the whole time. And then they get out of the car and just as they get out of the car, <laughs> 
the young man looked at him and went, wow, I'm sure glad I don't have to drive like that all the time. <laughs> was, he's like, all right, well, you don't pass. And, you know, that, unfortunately, when I read that, I thought, well, that's kind of like a lot of Christians do. It's a good thing I don't have to act this good all the time the way I do in church. Or when the pastor's around and I say all the right words, I'm, I'm going to be so happy when I don't have to do that anymore. I'm glad I don't have to do that all the time. These are issues, you know, we have to, we have to look into what it is that we're seeking. It goes back to that Piper quote, what are you craving? Are you craving holiness? Are you craving righteousness? Are you craving Christ? Or are you craving time away from that so you can go be who you want to be? Um, the, you know, the divorce rate in, with Christians isn't much different than in the world. As a matter of fact, last poll I saw said that third on the list of the most divorces right behind doctors and lawyers are pastors. So, it, it, you know, we, we live in a world that is difficult, and unless we strive toward being set apart from that world, not belonging to this world, seen as different from this world, then we will become this world. And, you know, I, I think Peter's point here in these next verses, in verses 13 through 16, is to give us that reminder. So let me look at these verses with you, verses 13 through 16. He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Now, you know, being holy, like I said, has nothing to do with being perfect. Being holy means being set apart and being different. So what Paul, Peter is saying here to us is Jesus was very much set apart, absolutely different, and therefore shunned by his own people. He's saying just as he's holy, we are to be set apart as well, which means you can't conform to this world. Holiness starts in your brains. You know, it starts in your mind. It's, it's not surprising that the first thing Peter says in regards to a life of holiness is um, that you have to move in this. It, it moves into a, a, a not conforming the passions of what you used to do. And, you know, the word he uses for guard is actually a military term. And it's a military term that talks about setting up guard posts around an entire encamped um, area. So when he's saying that's literally what you need to do with your brain, with your mind, you've got to set up a guard, like a military guard against the world and the onslaught of that. And, you know, holiness requires that you know what's going on in your mind and that you're spiritually alert. The, the term that Peter uses here, the sober-minded, that's really a favorite of his. He likes to use that term. He uses it later on in chapter 5, verse 8. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, you know, if, if I look out this window right now, my kids are in the house and I see a lion out there, I'm not going to let them go outside and play. You know, if it's prowling around, you don't let them, you don't want to walk out into the path of a prowling a prowling lion, you know, allowing your brain and your mind, which will eventually do your um, move into your actions to be conformed to the world and not conform to holiness is the same thing as, as getting drunk and then going out and playing in the street whenever there's a lion prowling around. You don't do that. The point is we're in, we're in enemy territory here. This is, this is not my home. The Bible very clearly tells us that, that this, is the, this is the realm of Satan. This is the devil. This, he is the Lord of this world. And so in terms of him being the Lord of this world, we're in enemy territory. You've got to be alert. You've got to be sober-minded. You've got to be thinking clearly about what's actually occurring here. And, and this kind of holy living is motivated, motivated by grace. You can't do it. <laughs> you know, I, which is... That's helpful to remember that it's not about me, but I have been given the grace which has saved me, and that grace will allow me to understand and to move into that holiness, that set-apartness. And, and the, the hardest part, however, here, I think for us, is understanding that in order to be set apart, you have to be obedient. Now, we don't like that word. And, and I know that people, you know, will run from the word obedient because that feels like you have rules and you have laws and somebody's making you follow them. Well, you know, God is a God. He loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And he doesn't give you his rules and his laws and his guidelines to restrict you. He gives you his rules and his laws and his guidelines to free you toward holiness. Because you can't do it without that. 
If you don't follow his guidelines and his rules and his laws and the things that he set, apart, set for you, you can't be set apart. So in order to be set apart, to move toward holiness, you've got to be obedient to what he tells you to do. And it's not about restricting you or making your life no fun. It's about making sure you're not part of a world you don't belong to. And he does this out of love. And we have to get past this whole idea that, that the laws and the rules and the guidelines in the Bible are there to restrict and make you unhappy when the absolute opposite is true. You know, we, and, he, and Peter says this a couple of times in these verses. We got we to gotta take a break. We got to make a break from our past lifestyle. He says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. We've got to establish a habit of obedience. He says, be obedient children. And then we have to get out of this distinction between our beliefs and our lifestyles that somehow or another I can believe one thing and live another way. That, that you can't do that. You can't say I believe here and then live somewhere else. There's no distinction between those two. And that's when Peter says, be holy in all your conduct. So this moving toward holiness is, we got to remember God's holy. And that's who we want to be with. You want to be with him. He set apart. We move toward that kind of holiness. And I want to end just very briefly here with why do we need to be holy? What is the point? And I kind of already covered that. But in verses 17 through 21, Peter really does put a lid on that. So let's read that and end this section with that. 17 through 21. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. And I love how Peter calls my time on earth as the time of my exile. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. We, why, why do I want to be set apart? Well, A, I want to be set apart because this ain't my home. I, I, don't, I don't want to think this is all I've got. If I woke up every morning and thought this is all there was, no wonder, I'd, be, I'd just be like, well, forget it. What's the point? This is not good. None of this is good. You might have moments of happiness, but this is not good. If this is all I got, that would make us miserable. This is not all we have. We are exiles living here until we get to what we have. And we get what we're going to get because Christ did what he did for us. Why be holy? Why be set apart? You've been given eternity. I mean, we've been given absolute forever in, and to languish in inexpressible joy, the way Peter puts it, because of what Jesus did. And if you really can grasp the beauty of that, then living a lifestyle that sets you apart from a world that doesn't have that, that's a no-brainer. Of course, you don't. You, I mean, if you know what you've been given, you don't want to be part of something that's not going to get that. So again, I, I, I want to, you know, this whole movement toward holiness really does require that you understand, because we think we have this view of holiness being perfection or whatever, and that's not the meaning of the word. It is moving toward a lifestyle that is not conforming to this world. It's moving toward a lifestyle that is set apart as unto Christ. That's when he says you are called to be holy just as I am holy. He's telling you you're called to not fit in here just like I didn't fit in here. That's what we're called to. And when we do that, we, we'll, we'll move in the joy of knowing where we're going. And these are, these are encouraging words because, you know, when I look around at my life sometimes, this life that makes me tired, which is why I called this tired of standing, I, I need to be reminded that this is not my home. I am not to be a part of this. I'm to minister in this to point toward what is eternal. But this is not my home and I'm not part of it. I'm, I'm to be set apart from that. That's really encouraging because I feel like I don't belong a lot of times, which is where some of that unhappiness comes. And I know that you do too. And, and that's okay. That's, that's the encouraging part. We're supposed to not belong. We're supposed to feel uncomfortable here. Um, there's going to be a day when we will feel none of that again, where we're just going to be in absolute joy in the presence of our Father. Again, let me encourage you, go to debwaterbury.com, download these PDFs. They will help you. There are other questions that I don't even get to as I'm talking about that will take you deeper into these verses. So I encourage you to do that either alone or in a group. God bless you, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for joining me today on this episode of Get Real with Deb Waterbury. I hope you were blessed, and I hope you got some information that's going to help you get through your day. 
you want any more information on any of my books or my articles or on any of my future speaking engagements, you can find all that information at debwaterberry.com. God bless you.